Hi everyone, this is George. Hi everyone, welcome to George's Library. This is George and today we're going to talk about The Chronicles of Narnia, The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis. I don't know how many of you are familiar with The Chronicles of Narnia movie. It came out not long after The Lord of the Rings. Um, this is back in 2001, 2002, 2003, uh, after The Return of the King won like 11 Oscars. And uh, the fantasy genre started booming and Hollywood started making tons of fantasy films because they wanted to have the same success as Lord of the Rings did back in those days. It's hard to achieve the same type of success. I mean, not even The Hobbit. Oh, and I, I don't... Oh, man, I, I don't want to get into The Hobbit. But The Hobbit, which was... <sighs> Never mind. Let's get back to the Chronicles of Narnia. So there are seven books in the series. The first one ever written was The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And after he finished writing it, C.S. Lewis came with the idea of a prequel, as you do. He decided to publish the books in the chronological Narnian history. So The Magician's Nephew is the first book in the series. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe would be the second. And then everything else goes forward from there. So my book, my edition has uh, all seven of them in the chronological Narnian history that C.S. Lewis wanted. Reading The Magician's Nephew, I can understand why he wants this to be the first book in the series. Not just because it's a prequel, not just because it shows how Narnia was created and it shows the beginnings of Narnia and uh, the genesis of everything, but we're going to get into that later. The Magician's Nephew is perfect as the beginning of the series. It makes you engaged in this world. It makes you want to know more. It makes you want to keep on reading and exploring this amazing, amazing world. I have to add, this is my first reading of the Chronicles of Narnia. I have seen the films. I only remember parts of the first one. But uh, other than that, I... I cannot say that I have been very familiar with with the Narnian history or the Narnian world and all of that. If any of you read this before and have different opinions than I do, then I will be happy to discuss all of that with you in the comments. So, The Magician's Nephew. Well, first of all, I have to say C.S. Lewis wastes no time to get us into the story. From the first two pages, you know the characters, you know the plot, and you're there, you're, you're going into this. You are full in the adventure. The main characters are Diggory and Polly. Diggory is a boy whose mom is sick and has to move in with his uncle Andrew and his aunt. Uh, I don't remember the aunt's name, but she's also not important in the story. And Polly is his next door neighbor. Of course, they become friends and start playing around when they find out about this mysterious attic that Uncle Andrew likes to go in quite often during the day and he is forbidden to search. Of course, what they do is they start exploring that room, that attic. While exploring the room, they accidentally stumble upon Uncle Andrew. He locks the door very quickly and explains to the kids what he's actually doing in there. As it turns out, Uncle Andrew had a godmother with, as he says, one of the last people in the world that still had fairy blood going through their veins. So practically, he's one of the last people in the world who had a fairy godmother. So his fairy godmother gave him some magic dust when he was a kid, before she died. And he always knew that this dust is magical and is meant to open new worlds for him. He never managed to figure it out, but he always kept exploring the possibilities of that. And what he came up with is, what he eventually did is to use the dust to create some rings out of it. Now there are two types of rings, yellow rings and green rings. And the kids saw both of these types around the room. The yellow rings are meant to transport you to a new world and the green rings are meant to bring you back. The reason Uncle Andrew was so happy that the kids stumbled upon his room and he practically kidnapped them is that he was too afraid to use the rings on himself. So he wanted a volunteer, volunteer, to transport into this new world 
and uh, also to bring back and tell him about what he sees. So this volunteer is supposed to use the yellow ring to go to this new world and then use the green ring to come back. Polly was very attracted to the golden rings, so Uncle Andrew tricked her into touching them and the moment she touched the ring, she just vanished. By the way, can you think of another novel that has magical rings that make you vanish when using them? Diggory is not very happy about it, but he doesn't want to leave his friend behind, so he so he puts one of the green rings in his pockets and uses his own golden ring to co to go and save Polly from wherever she is. Eventually they end up in a woods which is called just one sec, I'm gonna search for it. The Wood Between the Worlds. The Wood Between the Worlds is The Wood Between the Worlds is exactly what the name says. It's practically a trash hole between different worlds. Old ones, new ones, dying ones, whatever it is. The air is fresh here, the trees are big and tall, and there are a lot of puddles. And if you jump inside the puddles, then you will be transported into the new world. So each puddle is practically a world that you can get into. Of course, you need to have the ring on for, for this to work. While there, Diggory finds Polly and decides that he wants to actually explore one of those puddles. And so both of them agreed to pick one, which they did, use the rings, jump in, and see what they find. They end up in a world where the sun is dying, practically. Everything is red. The sun has a red light flowing from it. There are a lot of ruins and statues of huge people that look like kings and queens, but huge, huge people. I must add, C.S. Lewis was a theologist, so he used a lot of biblical elements in his novels, particularly Chronicles of Narnia. One of the most fascinating things is to see the parallels between the biblical story of the Genesis and the story in the Chronicles of Narnia as it unfolds. First example that I noticed would be this one. This land that they discovered is called the Land of Charm. And it reminded me of the descriptions of hell, practically. All the reddish sights, all that silence, that morbid silence, the dying sun. It's like a parallel with John Milton's Paradise Lost. I think it would be easy to see the resemblance between the land of Charn and the descriptions of hell in multiple, multiple literature elements. During their exploration of the land, they eventually end up waking up Queen Jadis, or Jadis, whom we find out was the reason for the destruction of that world, and she was to blame for this. She was not afraid to admit it, though. This is not a spoiler. Again, the description of Queen Jadis made me think a lot about Lucifer, the fallen angel. Jadis was described as a very beautiful being. So was Lucifer. Lucifer was described as the most beautiful angel in the world, and then because he wanted to be equal to his creator, he eventually fell from his high position to the depths of hell and became the devil that we know today. Queen Jadis is clearly a character that was parallel to Lucifer and his fall from heaven. And her story also can be easily parallel with Lucifer's fall from heaven and Lucifer's story. That being said, the queen is very interested in the kids. She wants to leave the world, she's happy that she's awake, and knowing that these kids came from a different world, younger world, she decides to follow them and go back to Earth, which she does. Eventually, she ends up in our world, in the human world. She meets Uncle Andrew, who is mesmerized by her. After a series of events on Earth that I will not get into right now, they try to get rid of her and send her back to wherever she came from or to anywhere else. In trying to get rid of her, they eventually end up back into the wood between the worlds and then into Narnia, or what it is to become Narnia. They ended up in the new world of Narnia while it was being created. They practically witnessed the creation of Narnia. The people witnessing the creation of Narnia are the two kids Diggory and Polly, 
uh, the witch, Queen Jadis, Uncle Andrew, a cabbie from the streets of London who just got mixed up in this entire situation by accident, and his horse, Strawberry. The reason I am pointing out these names is that these characters are very important throughout the story. The chapters that show us the creation of Narnia are very beautiful. You practically see it through the eyes of these kids. In the middle of this darkness and light, there is a lion. And his roar is not a roar, his roar is a song. And through his song, everything starts growing. You can see the trees growing around you, the flowers, the grass, you can see the light, the sun being f shining, the sun shining bright as a newborn sun. The animals are practically coming out of the ground and spreading around, all the different types of animals just spreading around and exploring. Regardless of that, I've never read a book where I can actually witness the Genesis. I read the Bible when I was much, much younger. I read it as a story, of course, and I was fascinated about the beginnings and the story, and I have all sorts of images built in my mind. But I can't say that I've ever explored it like I did with this novel, where you're actually sitting there watching this creator doing his work and bringing everything to life with uh, with the use of song with the use of art there are so there are so many things in this novel that can be uh, looked upon and there are so many choices that c.s lewis did that make you wonder why why is the world created through song why is the roar music what did he mean by that you know it's not it's not about the choices he made, which are extremely beautiful, but it's also beautiful to think, why did he, why did he make this choice? Why is this a lion singing? Why is the world built of song? What does music mean to the author that he thought music must be powerful enough to build worlds? Very interesting, very beautiful. I love these. I love these things. I will talk a little bit about the writing style and add some of the cons that I have about this. So the writing style is very fairy tale like. That's not a bad thing necessarily, it's very easy to read. Like I said, the deafness of the story can be profound in itself and very beautiful to explore. And because of the simple, let's say, tone of it, it can be read by anyone really. The novel does nothing less, but also nothing more than showing the creation of Narnia. And I say this in that order because you do feel like the writer simply had some ideas in his mind about what he wants to explain. And then he pretty much just checked them off the list, you know? Like, how did the wardrobe end up in the second novel? Checked. Why is there an apple so important? Checked. How did the witch appear in Narnia? Checked. It feels a little bit mechanically structured. And I did read somewhere that it took him five years to write this one, to write The Magician's Nephew, because of that. He actually tried to work on it as much as possible so it doesn't feel so mechanically, so mechanical. So he practically worked on it a long time to make it smoother, make, make the transition between the chapters, the transition between these steps smoother than, uh, than they were. So it could have been worse than that. Don't get me wrong, the book is really, really good, and it's very, very enjoyable, and I cannot wait to go through the next of, to the next part of the series. I cannot wait to see what happens next and to explore Narnia more. Another thing is that he's very explanatory in a lot of parts, especially as you go towards the end, and certain elements of the future novels do appear in this one. He actually points out in some chapters that particular scenes are related to future novels. So he, when I say pointing out, I mean, he's actually saying like, hey, that's going to be in that novel. This is important for you to know because it's, it's in that novel. And I'm thinking like, why? Maybe it's because prequels were not as popular back in those days. I mean, C.S. Lewis was one of the first people, I think, who got into this entire prequel madness that is today all in all i can't wait to read the rest of the novels 
I really, really loved getting into this world. If you're also interested in reading the Chronicles of Narnia, please let me know in the comments. If you like reading books and if you like talking about books, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. See you next time when we will discuss the lion, the witch and the wardrobe. I wish you all the best and just keep reading.